Hey guys, Kawaiti here. Just wanted to do a really quick video, but it might be one of my more important ones as it deals with the basic concept of the illusion of more shares. Yep, that's right. We're just going to jump right in. So one of the beginner questions that we see a lot in, in Blossom and in other places is when a beginner compares two ETFs that track the same thing and they're wondering if there's any key differences between them. And one of the most often aspects of the ETF is the share price. So VFB here, very popular ETF that tracks the S&P 500, is $108.20 at the time of this recording. And ZSP is the BMO one, is at 66.69. And, and some people think, or wonder rather, if BMO is better because it's cheaper. It, it could be. You can argue that it's better in the sense that it's easier to buy more shares of unless you're in well simple where you can buy fractional shares. But the key thing is for the most part, if you can invest similar amounts of money between them, it doesn't really matter. Like the, the amount of shares you're going to have doesn't matter because it tracks the same index. And if the S&P goes up 10%, you're going to your amount that you've invested will go up 10%, whether you have ZSP or VFV. Now, obviously I have to take a quick second to plug the beginner cheat sheet that I made that links a bunch of beginner questions that I frequently see asked on Blossom. So definitely check it out. The link will be in the description. I was actually inspired to make this video by many recent posts that I've seen in the beginner investor section of Blossom. So people will generally ask what they should invest in or talk about their, their plan, uh, their long-term plan. So here someone just suggests XEI as well as VDY have monthly distributions. You could spend five years compounding your monthly distribution. So these are like the two most popular Canadian ETFs. And generally people recommend them because you get a bunch of dividends that you use to compound by buying more shares. Now the question becomes like, is buying more shares, does it matter as much as people think it does or is it psychological? I know at a base minimum, it's like motivating, right? Getting more shares, it feels good, keeps people investing. But for people who, who want to view it from a pure math standpoint, does it actually matter? It was actually another post that made me feel a, a high level of concern. Um, I'm just going to read parts of it. I'm just trying to understand everyone's thought process is my core ideas. Or to buy at least 4,000, 5,000 shares of VDY and stop buying as it's dripping now. So let it be drip for the next 20 years. And as per my calculation, it's supposed to give me around 25K per year. Same way my next portfolio should contain 6,000 shares of HYLD and just keep it on for dripping. And after the same time horizon, I will stop dripping. HYLD will produce around 20K without holding the fund. Am I thinking wrong or missing something again? So I've already replied to him twice uh, on Blossom where I felt like he's making too many assumptions. Basically that the fund will last, that the yield will stay the same, that the performance of the underlying funds will perform okay for the next 20 years. And when you're concentrating your portfolio towards specifically like 50-ish, in the case of VDY, 50-ish uh, dividend funds in Canada, you know, it's not, you can't assume a lot of, you can't make a lot of assumptions and make these calculations and feel like you're going to get 25K per year for sure. So, that, that's that's why it really concerns me. It just seems like a lot of people just might be just taking the yield percentage and calculating the number of shares and then trying to deduce the amount of money that they're going to be able to get via dividends. By the end of that, pretty sure that there's no way those calculations are going to be accurate or, or precise for to know what you're gonna get in 20 years. Now we're in my Google Sheets lab. And uh, if my explanation here is too complicated, please let me know in the comments and I'll delete the video and reshoot it because I really want this to be clear. Uh, on, on this side, we're going to compare a dividend stock with a non-dividend stock. And we're going to assume that for the most part, they're the same and they're going to have the same return because uh, just to prove a point here. So a dividend stock, let's say, is $10 and you have 20 shares of it and $200 total. Same on the non-dividend side. And we'll jump to the non-dividend side because it's, it's simpler. Once it has a total, let's assume a total return of 10%, so it goes up a dollar, you still have 20 shares, it's worth $220. Going back to the dividend side, same thing, but on the ex-dividend date, the price will jump down to $10 based on how, many, how much money the company is giving to its shareholders via dividend. So we're going to assume a dollar per share in this case. So $10, you still have 20 shares. So now your total amount invested is $200. But at some point in the payout date, 
you get paid twenty dollars. Now, most people understand this to this is how it's going to work theoretically a lot of the time, and whether you're a dividend investor or not. And then what people are excited about dividend investors is that they're able to use that twenty dollars and not that the the price of ten dollars to buy two more shares at ten dollars. So bringing up their total of twenty shares plus two shares to twenty two shares. But now the price since the price is ten dollars, you multiply. And again, you get $220. Same amount here. And moving forward, regardless of the fact that there's more shares on the dividend side, they're going to perform about the same, right? It's like the example we gave previously with VSP, not VSP, ZSP and VFV. They're going to perform about the same as long as their total return is the same. If they, if they both go up 10% total return wise, it's about the same. Now, it might... Like there's a lot of things that make it not the same, but that's like beyond the scope of this video, which is like, obviously the price of the share does not drop exactly by the amount of the dividend given on, on the day, on the ex-dividend day, because there's just so many factors at play, the market sentiment, um, ex investor expectations. There's, there's a lot of things at play that affects so that the numbers don't actually happen in reality as cleanly as it looks. But the, the example here is to show that you can have a lot more shares and you're going to perform about the same than someone who has less shares, but their share price, the share price of each share is higher. And that's why I think my favorite content creator in the finance space has so many dividend and dividend irrelevance videos. It's because the primary focus should be your total returns. The number of shares might just distract you from picking a strategy that is less diversified than it should be. I do get asked, well, so what do you recommend KYT in, in these posts? And everyone who's watched a lot of my videos will know that I recommend an all-in-one, such as SEQT because it's globally diversified. And I don't want to come across as saying VDY is bad because I'm sure a lot of you have it as part of a diversified portfolio. The advice usually from these like videos that feel like they're anti-dividend when they're really not is the fact that beginners get misguided by a lot of concepts easily and there's a lot of beginners who also after they sort of misunderstand a concept love to share as we know love to share on blossom or on youtube and this misinformation sort of spreads and then sometimes like this influx of anti-dividend uh, content might seem like we're hating on dividends but okay, if you know me well then you know that it's like it's irrelevant like i don't really care if something is dividend or growth you just care about being geographically diversified and sector diversified because if you don't have enough dividends in your portfolio you're probably not exposed to canadian banks canadian financials and canadian energy so it's important to have both that said i think vdy is a bit too expensive for what it does and there's cheaper options out there mer is kind of like too much when i compare it to something like xeqt well i'm saying it really fast and weird xeqt that has roughly 9,700 stocks is cheaper than VDY. So you're, you're paying for the selection, uh, the small selection, like I said, it says 53 holdings. doesn't really make sense to me when you can invest in VCN, which is the MER is 0.05%. And not only that, you have exposure to 176 stocks. Now, the last thing I'll talk about in this video is that the concern about needing to sell shares, they're, they're scared. First of all, I don't know why there's such a concern because on Blossom, a lot of you complaining about this stuff, about having to sell shares 20 years from now, like you're concerned about what future you has to do. When some of you are buying and selling on a weekly, if not daily basis, or reacting to news on a daily basis, it's like somehow you can buy and sell things really frequently now but the idea of perhaps selling shares on a consistent basis in 20 years is too complicated so i i just really want you guys to really think about what you're saying and if that really makes sense when you're saying oh selling is bad but from a just math standpoint let's go back to our example here if we go to the x dividend date on the left side where we talked about how it shoots out a $20 dividend. And let's say, let's assume that's money that you need to, uh, to pay for your bills and stuff. So you have $20 that shoots, you don't have to sell anything. You keep your 20 shares 
instead of getting grabbing and buying more shares and getting 22, you stay at 20. On the growth side, you have to sell shares, but selling shares is almost like giving yourself a dividend. And in this case, you can sell enough shares. Again, it depends on fractional shares and stuff like that, but let's, let's just assume that things work like this. You can sell $20 of shares. You end up with less, 18.18. But once again, if you compare both sides, because the share prices is different and because your total investment in the market is the same, it doesn't really matter that you have less shares moving forward. As long as both of these entities perform, have the same total return, it's, a, it's gonna perform the same. And what this means is that what's more important than the number of shares, than the dividends, than this compounding that people overhype is the underlying fund. And if that's the most important part, then based on academic theory and everything that you've seen on my channel, it's all about having that underlying fund be diversified. So if you're picking stuff like VDY and HYLD and have that as a great percentage of your portfolio, you're putting your portfolio at extreme risk, extreme risk. You're tying your portfolio because you think it treats dividends to a specific type of stock, to a specific perhaps geography. And I don't like, it sounds like I'm being aggressive, but it's like, it's so, I just want to convey just how dangerous it is. Like it gets me emotional a little because it's, um, you're, I don't want people to realize it 15, 18, 20 years down the line that they made a mistake because some people who invest this way, they're like, Oh, we'll see if, if I'm right or wrong. And it's like the results, like stock results, stock futures are so uncertain. It's like rolling. I, I would say I would compare it to flipping a coin and then saying you were right because you guess heads or, or, or tails. No, it's like, we don't know the future. And even if it works out in your favor, it does not mean the decision you made in the first place was correct, right? That's like results being results oriented. So there's a lot of concepts to be able to make a prudent decision now. And I just hope people uh, do it. And if this video even changes one person's way of viewing things, I did my job. And with that said, I'll see you in the next one.